Um, throughout worship, I'm, I'm just impressed. Um, something's impressed on me. Will you do me a favor? Raise your hand if you were here um, last Sunday, just so I have a sense. Okay, beautiful. Um, so those of you who are here, for those of you who were not here, the Lord kind of, um, <laughs> well, he answered what our prayer always is. He, he took over and did what he wanted, um, all kinds of things that were not our game plan. And um, we ended up just praying for Israel in three prayer movements. We worshiped and we prayed for Israel and we worshiped some more and prayed and, and um, anything I had planned um, didn't happen and we did that. For, for those of you that were here, the third prayer movement that we did, it became personal for us. Give me a night. You remember that? Okay. <laughs> um, and I realized it was one of those occasions where I, I, I moved us. I felt moved to move us into that third prayer movement, but I gave like one sentence to lead us into what we were doing. And um, I've thought about it all week and realized I didn't really communicate. And the Lord's just been pressing on me to communicate this. Okay. And you can go ahead and be seated. Okay. Because I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this for just a minute before we move on. Um, what was impressed on me is, as, as Israel is under fire, um, and um, they're, the borders there are, are being warred against and missiles are coming in. Um, I think the only thing I said last week was, you know, we're grafted in. We are. The only reason <laughs> we're of the family is because we're, we're grafted in. We are part of Israel. Y'all know this. Okay. And what's impressed on my heart, and the reason we did that last prayer movement last week is because I, I also believe, now it's very real, right? Don't, don't misunderstand me here, but there's, there is a physical picture of things going on in the spirit. You all follow me? In other words, as part of Israel, let me put it this way. It seems like everybody that... Um, I'm in touch with, including my own family, everyone who is on a journey that is bringing glory to God and is, is on a journey to where we're going to bring gl great glory to God. We're on that journey, greater and greater glory, right? We too, I'm just noticing um, we too, just as Israel, we're, we're under attack. I don't, I don't know about you guys. Are you experiencing that? Missiles are coming in. It's like the boundaries... Everything from pesky stuff to big stuff feels like it's bombarding the families, the lives, the ministers um, of which we all are. And, um, and this is what I've got to tell you because last week I said it was just really heavy on my spirit. And was the presence of God heavy here last week or what? <laughs> okay, in that presence, it was really powerful upon me that there's a big yes right now. But it's a very particular yes from the courts of heaven. You ready? And this is why we moved into that third prayer movement. I want you to understand this because I don't think it was just for that morning. I think it's this season that we're in. Okay? And it's this, that... Where there's been resistance, where there's things to come down, I just believe this. It's a season of, um, of the Lord is going to bring those strongholds down. So, I, amen? So last week I mentioned specifically things like people you've been praying uh, praying for for a long time you you've been maybe maybe a decade or decades and just that the lord would come into their life that these strongholds and darknesses would break off and they'd know him i just feel like right now there's a big yes and you'll remember that what we prayed for Israel specifically, as, as we moved, we got to like the middle of the service and we're having prophetic words and, and we're, we're going into the spirit, praying for Israel into this stuff. 
the biggest thing that began to be impressed upon the body and move in words throughout the body last Sunday was that what's going on there, as evil and hor- horrible as it is, what's going on there is we just began to pray that there would be a great turning for, um, for the resistance to believe Jesus, that there would just be, that his name would become famous in Israel and that it'll become a spectacle that in what's going on, that Israel is coming to belief. Okay, now here's why I'm sharing that. I'd keep praying that for Israel. I believe that that's, that's what, do y'all agree with me? That's what the Lord wants to do. Okay, well, here's what I've got to say. It's also true, the reason we did that third prayer movement, I believe the same yes and the same plans for the courts of heaven are true for your families and your neighbors and the people you've been praying for. Um, dark things are going to fall and, and be praying for that. That's why we did that prayer. I didn't say any of that. That's why we did that prayer movement to conclude the service last week. Keep Keep at that, because I just firmly believe that as, as the missiles, I know, I'm hearing what's going on. You're having the missiles come in at your family, and, the, and everything from pesky things to horrible big things or calamities are coming against. I just want to tell you, be encouraged and just pray into the yes, because in the midst of you being attacked, there's a yes from the courts of heaven for your lost family members, for darknesses that are in your grown children, whatever's going on. I just, do you believe this with me, church? Okay, so don't let that go. Keep praying into that. The missiles are not gonna win, okay? All right, amen. All right, now pray with me. Lord, I ask that your word would go out powerfully this morning. We thank you for this great yes in your kingdom. And we agree with the courts of heaven that you're on the move. And we thank you that the time has come for the darknesses, the bondages, the confusions to fall off. We thank you that you are, you have heard our prayers all these years, all this time. And we thank you that you win. Thank you, Jesus. And I ask, Lord, now that you will say what you want to say and that anything I say that's not of you, that it'll just drop off and, and be completely forgotten, but let the power of your word be everything you want it to be for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I want to tell you where we're going. So this morning um, is going to be, we're going to warm up for like half of the time, okay? And, <laughs> and part of it is, is going to be, um, I'm going to be kind of like moving through some scriptures on a theme really quickly, which you guys are awesome. You usually wouldn't really let me get away with that because we want to keep things in context and make sure we're teaching well. But I think I'm entitled to do this because these are all scriptures that have been in this series. And we've spent significant time on it. So if you find yourself going, wait a minute, we're jumping around. Um, what about that? You said that kind of fast. Go start at the beginning of the series. What, what number are we on back there? Seven. Seven. It's probably time for a, a new series. Um, I just can't get off of it, though. I feel like this is what he's doing. Okay, so... I'm just going to move through stuff, and I want to. I want to tell you this: the Word of God is full of things that, um, that as we mature, I, th- I think He wants us to understand. Okay, how it works, and so there are words like wisdom, understanding, okay, and stuff like that. Where are they the same thing? Um, knowledge? No, they're not the same thing. And then on top of it. We are body, soul, and spirit, right? We talk about this all the time here. So we're, we're very, he has made us um, very complex, okay? And the word of God does tell us things about how these things work in the context of this series that we've been in, okay? And, which is, let me put it out there for any visitors in the house. We've been in a series of, um, of how we can get wrapped in the world. We're reading scriptures on being, um, it's really said three different ways. Carnally minded, and we're going to read that scripture, I think. Um, the mindset on the flesh, where I think we're going to read that too. And the third way eludes me at the moment. And it's just, um, we've really been pressing into what it is to be spiritually minded so that, so that we're, we're walking with the Lord into everything he has in this new season, 
okay? I want you to go to Romans chapter 8. I'm, st- I'm going to start in verse 5. And see, this is where you, you got to permit. I, I've, I've earned the right now <laughs> on message number 7 to just kind of grab these scriptures because they are going to lead us into um, things we're going to look at in a story in the Bible that's going to totally speak to us. I believe this. So Romans 8, chapter 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. That's a parallel sentence in their language, so we could read it. Those, um, But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. You see this? Okay? Um, Can I just tell you, I got to remind here, remember, flesh is not evil. You know that, right? Flesh is not, does not equal sin. Let me put that out there. All this is saying is um, those who live according to the flesh, in other words, those who are wrapped up in worldly things, whatever it is, set their minds on those things. Now let me keep reading because here's, here's where it gets really serious. Verse six, for to be carnally minded is death. Okay, setting the mind on the things of the flesh is carnally minded. We got to take that with us. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. In other words, do you realize just setting your mind on the things of the flesh, there's no neutral in this vehicle? <laughs> setting, living where your mind is set on, on the worries, anxieties, um, you name it, the things that are of this world, even when we as Christians try to, try to make it like, um, make it a sacred thing. <laughs> um, Setting your mind on those things is carnal mindedness. And the word of God literally just told us that that, that that mind is enemy to God. It's not neutral. And we're going to see why as we, we keep moving forward. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed um, can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Whew, shiver with me, partly because you're too tired. I mean, you're, you're staring at me and you're starting to scare me. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm starting too serious too fast, but... <clears throat> okay, go to Romans 10. So we just went t- two, two chapters ahead here. Same letter church of, church, to the church of Rome and verse 10, okay? Chapter 10, verse 10. For with the heart... One believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scriptures, the scripture says, I can't really read today, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now I want to do this. Now, now listen in now, because this has taken us somewhere. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. Can I just tell you, faith is not an intellectual thing. <laughs> Um, I believe it's Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2, unless I got that wrong. It says, faith is the gift of God. Do I have the right address? Faith is the gift of God. You know, you didn't even come up with your own faith. You know that, right? It's not something you conjure up or you're like, man, I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm getting all, I'm, I've really worked myself into good faith. Faith is the gift of God. And this just, this just said, for with the heart, one believes under righteousness. Now you got to hang on to that because it's taken somewhere. Faith is given by God, and I'm about to show you how faith is really just an atmosphere. <laughs> it's an atmosphere that's created by what God gifts us in our heart. You probably think of other scriptures that say, um, to the measure that you're given. Okay, see, it's not, you, you didn't work yourself to this. You didn't study enough, go to enough Bible studies or, or pray till your knees are bloody. Faith is the gift of God and, and the measure that he gives, I'm gonna show you, is, is almost, um, almost an atmosphere, okay, for other things to operate. But for right now, note that it's a thing of the heart. It's not an intellectual thing. Okay, now um, go to um, Hebrews chapter 11. I'm starting right in verse 1. 
So I told you, you were going to have to let me kind of randomly pull stuff out of context. <laughs> but watch how this goes together. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, the gift of God <laughs> is a substance of things hoped for. And then verse 2, For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. And here's why we're reading this. You ready? By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Beginning of verse three, hear this phrase, by faith we understand. By faith, okay, the gift of God, we understand. Isn't that something? Can I tell you how this works? And I think it's, it's gonna prove itself out um, in the scriptures we continue to read, but this is how this works. God gives faith and understanding comes when our mind agrees, okay? Can I tell you that um, the word understanding is also tight in the word of God, in the scriptures, is tightly attached to, um, how many times do you read, if you have eyes to see, if you have ears to hear, you follow, that's understanding, Okay, so something can be said that's true um, from here when you read it, from your, um, you know, the rhema word of God as he speaks to you, it can be true. But you, do you ever notice when Jesus gets serious as a heart attack, a lot of times he'll say, um, if you have eyes to see, if you have ears to hear. That's saying, if you can understand. Now, let me tell you, um, now let's bring this back. So, Faith, the gift of God put in our heart, is really just like an atmosphere. It's, it's, um, <clears throat> it allows us to position ourselves to agree with our mind. That's understanding, to agree. Now, I need to know from you if I did okay or if, or if you're sitting there and your brain smoking. Both? Both? Okay, well, then we'll, we'll move on. As long as, as long as Dave's okay, then we're, we're good. <clears throat> okay, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, we spent a lot of time in this, so I'm going to cruise really fast, but we have to hit this because it's taking us where we're going. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if I didn't say it, verse 6, okay? It says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Now we're going to start talking about wisdom. You see, we talked about faith. <laughs> we have some idea of understanding. You have to trust me. This is taking us somewhere. Now we're talking about wisdom, okay? We speak wisdom among those who are mature, not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. What's happening to all the rulers of this age? They're coming to nothing. That's, that's a drop the scroll. I was visiting with, um, y'all remember, what's Chris, what's his last name? Chris, um, it doesn't matter. I was visiting with a pastor who used to be part of our body his last night like two weeks ago, and he's saying his, his wife bought him a scroll, like just a really, what was it? You mean Eric? Eric, yeah, yeah, Pastor Eric. He was in town. He said his wife bought him a scroll and whenever he read, reads a scripture like that, he picks up the scroll and goes, like when you don't even have to preach because it just said it and he just drops the scroll. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so going to do that. That's so cool. <laughs> anyway, why am I doing that? Um, yet not the wisdom of this age. The rulers of this age are coming to nothing. And I got to reiterate this. We can get... I'm going to say this now. We can get very busy, okay? Busy even in things that we're calling spiritual, even though they're completely pertaining to this world. Are you guys tracking with me? Okay? And this is making it crystal clear that the rulers of this age, the governments of this world, they're, they're coming to nothing. It says it right there. <laughs> Okay, yeah, even, do, do you know that the United States government is not Jesus' government? <laughs> it's so important to know that. Otherwise, we can go way off track in what we concern ourselves with, okay? And, and it, it can cause us to be very busy. In fact, I'm going to read it to you in stories in here, how that happens, okay? 
goes on, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Now, why is it hidden? We talked about this, um, I think it was, well, I'll just, it wasn't last week. Two weeks is way too long to expect you guys to remember something. So I'll just tell you. It's only hidden because, because of ever since the fall, our mind is cor- carnal. That's why in Romans chapter 12 it says we need to renew our mind, right? It's not that God is hiding. I mean, if anything, he hides it like, um, I don't, like we would hide Easter eggs for our children, and it's not like we take a backhoe and we bury it 10 feet underground and go, ha, ah, you're never going to find it, kid. That's not what, it's, it's hidden. What does it say? Um, that it is, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to seek it out and discover it. You see, our Father God, he's, he's waiting for us to, um, he wants us to find the egg, okay? And it's like, you know, when the kids are like, um, three years old or whatever, it's that you don't bury it under the, the cupboard in the far back. You set it right in the, <laughs> you set it right in the middle of the floor. So everybody can delight, oh you found it. That's how our Father is with us. He's placing things in front of you because he can't wait to delight in the fact that you found it. Okay? And so here it is telling us um, that to the mature, they speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, only mysterious because we're in the journey of the renewal of the mind. It's not mysterious in the courts of heaven. You know that, right? It goes on the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. How, How many knew? None. Okay. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, I'm about to stop this one, but I've got to read this so you make the connection. Verse 9. But as it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard. Do you hear the eyes, ears thing? Okay. In other words, having understanding out of the faith that we've been given, our mind agrees that, that we're loved, we're secure, our, our fathers got us. Okay, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But for us, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Okay, go to James chapter three. I still promise we're going somewhere. If it feels like an epic journey, it's, we're about to bring it home. Okay. James chapter 3, verse 13. It starts out, who is wise and understanding among you? I just want you to notice there's two things there, okay? (laughs) Wise, so ability to apply knowledge. um, Wise and understanding, okay? Now, what do we say that is? Understanding is the mind that can see. It's because of the faith you have. Understanding is the mind that can see. God, I can see what you're up to. God, I can see that even though the world is deceiving me into thinking we have these problems or those problems and they they should riddle me to to death and make me anxious and worried. You see, this is um, who is wise and understanding. A mind that understands that God's got it because the mind has agreed with what's been put in the heart. Do you know the world wants to make it, as hard as it can, this world wants to make it hard for your mind to agree with what's true, which will rarely make sense. You, you guys get that, right? I mean, we're going to see it in the Word of God as we keep reading, but it, generally speaking, it's always going to be upside down, right? It's not, it, it's, faith is not an intellectual thing where you can go, oh, I get it. <laughs> it's usually going to be a ridiculous thing. The, the things God gives faith for, the gift of God faith, is going to be things that don't align with everything we've been talking about in this series. The mind set on the flesh, the carnal mind. And in, in this passage, we're, we're about to see this more clearly than anything we've done. So, so watch this. It goes on. Um, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. 
Isn't that an interesting phrase? The meekness of wisdom. Do we normally think of wisdom as like a meek or a humble thing? <laughs> no, usually you'd be like, oh, they're so wide. Like, I mean, it's a pedestal thing, right? It's a pride thing. Like, um, I don't, first of all, have you ever met anybody that didn't think they were wise? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a pride thing, am I right? Okay, now I'm, the older I get, the more I realize, whew, God's really got to work on my wisdom. I mean, but um, let's just put it out there. that This is saying the meekness of wisdom. Now I'm going to show you something. If you think that's peculiar right there, it's the, as I keep reading, it's going to begin talking about sin. Now watch this, which I personally think is odd. Do, do you agree with that? It says, um, so let me start that again. Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Verse 14, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Now don't worry, it's not, it's not about to turn into a hellfire and brimstone preaching up here. I just want to tell you this. Notice again, there's two things. There's bitter envy. And before I even move on, I want to tell you what that is. Envy, in fact, all sin, but let's say envy, since that's what we're reading here, only comes from wounds. Do you know that? And this goes back to like three messages ago. You guys remember being in the Garden of Eden and, and what happened in that fall? Well, this is that. Envy comes from a creature that, that, is, that is vulnerable, and you know what happened there? We were suddenly vulnerable. We suddenly needed to take care of ourselves or, or I need what you got. Suddenly we were needy. That, that's the best way to say it. We we're very, very needy. Do you know you're needy? If you forget that, you can call me this week. And I'll remind you. <laughs> you guys are needy. No, we're all needy, okay? And, and it's, it's just the product of the fall. And this is saying, this is talking about the meekness of wisdom, okay? And it's saying, um, but if you have bitter envy, in other words, if you have wounded motivation, if you're out, let's try this. If you're outside the fact that I am absolutely secure in my Father, that's what this is talking about, bitter envy, okay? And self-seeking was the second thing. Can I tell you what that is? That's fear-based thinking, okay? That's worldly thinking. That's thinking from fear and vulnerability. Why do I say that? Self-seeking. Help me, Lord. How do you do this? Um, self-seeking. Do you know the only reason we become self-seeking is because, is because of exactly what we're talking about. Is because we're not absolutely secure in the Father, okay? Lies have landed from our woundedness and we become self-seeking as opposed to loving, loving like he is. Able to trust, absolutely secure. Are we good there? Okay, good, because I'm, I'm about to bring that first thing we're going to do. It's coming. Verse 15 says, this wisdom, now notice that word. Do you notice it doesn't say it's not wisdom? It says this wisdom. So even the word of God acknowledges that this is a type of wisdom, and it's not the only place that does that. There are, I don't know, I didn't count. There are three, four, five places in the word of God that contrasts two wisdoms. And here it says, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Wow. <laughs> right? That's a pretty strong word. What? Just being self-seeking. is being described as demonic. Well, I'm starting to tell you why, and we're going to put a fine point on it in a minute. Verse 16, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Confusion. Can we just recognize that's the opposite of understanding? Okay? Do you see how security, security in which is only given, it's by the faith of God, okay? It's the gift of faith. But being secure in who, in the Father's love, in who he says you are, is the freedom from bitter envy, self-seeking. And it, it unlocks living, hear this now, 
it unlocks living in a place of confusion and instead living in a place of understanding. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I better not, st- better not start talking about that sentence. I'm going to leave it. We could teach on that last sentence for a half an hour, but let's don't. Um, here's what I've got to tell you, and, and I hope you connect it. I hope I didn't do that too fast. Much of what we call wisdom is actually wound and fear-based, and it's the wisdom of this world. In other words, let me do this. Carnal thinking is often clothed as wisdom. Can I give you an example? And I'll give you one that you all know about. You ever been hurt by somebody or betrayed by somebody? Okay, and you all know how the scenario goes. Then what happens is you go, well, it's not safe to trust like that. It's not, it's not safe to put my heart out there like that. And this is, this is carnal thinking that's not absolutely secure in the Father. It, you following? In other words, I need security from, from other people. I need you or you to love me in such a way for me to be okay. Are you tracking? This is all carnal thinking. And it would be clothed as wisdom, right? It's, I better protect myself. Um, it's self-seeking, right? Let's do another one just to make sure we got this because it, it's going to move us. Um, you know it happens even in the church. A lot of what would be considered, <laughs> let's call it good church management, a good five-year plan. <laughs> How about that? Um, is a lot of it is carnal thinking, is the mindset on the flesh, not the upside-down stuff that you actually need faith for. That's the gift of God because he's the head of the church and he's taken us where we're going. Do you know that many of the things that we do are actually carnal thinking? It's the mindset on the flesh and we like to call it, oh, it's spiritual, right? And it's, um, it's, it's not what leads us into the will of God. It's actually thought of as wisdom. Are you guys tracking? But it's not. It's, it's world wisdom. Did those two examples work for you guys? Okay, in that case, um, I think we're ready for this final, this part I'm really excited about. We're ready for this now. Um, Let me say one more thing. Do you know that, so what we just said, and it's so important you walk forward with this. In other words, wisdom, the type of wisdom you live by, okay, can either be fueled by your woundedness, yeah, or, or your, la- your vulnerability, your woundedness, or wisdom is fueled by faith that is the wisdom from above. This is the earthly wisdom. You see this? Okay, all right, we're ready now. I'm ready. Are you ready? <laughs> okay, then um, here's what we're going to do. I want you to turn, if you're a paper turner, Go to John chapter 12, put a finger there, and go to Luke chapter 10 and put a finger there. Okay, so you got both because we're going to toggle back and forth. And I'll tell you why. It's actually the same story. It's the same room. It's the same moment. And when you, when you take the gospel of John and you pair it up with the gospel of Luke, you, you suddenly get all this wisdom. Like you get the whole electricity of the room, all the people involved, okay? And that's what we're going to do here. I'm starting in the John 12 one, verse 1, okay? Here it says, Then six days before the Passover, in other words, right before Jesus is about to be crucified, right? Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he'd raised from the dead. There they made him supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. 
Yep, we're going to do a story I bet you everybody in the house knows. But, but watch this now. Let's set the scene just so, just so that we're, we're there, just so that we don't leave it like, like religious and we don't feel that this is a real room. Recognize what's going on here. There's a dude in the room at the table that Jesus just raised from the dead. You would think that that would be very (laughs) faith-inspiring. Are you guys tracking with me? Okay? The other thing you got to understand, Jesus just performed, there were seven miracles that, that they knew, seven signs or miracles, that they knew that when you see somebody who does all seven, that's him. Okay? This was the final. This was the final one. So this is at a moment where the electricity is so high. Jesus just did the final thing, and he knew it, everybody knew it, that this would be the thing that would make him go, ooh, we've, we have got to kill him now. Or he Because he's, he's done all the thing. He's going to be able to claim he's the Messiah, and we all have to go, we know it. All seven signs have now happened with this guy. And that, so here they are gathered in this room. They're making, they're making dinner for Jesus. And, and the atmosphere is they're sitting with somebody in that room who was dead. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> now, I had to set the scene. Go to Luke 10. Keep your finger there. We're going back to John. Luke 10, 38. <clears throat> and it says, Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. Now, you've all read this. You know this story, but let me tell you what we usually do and we're gonna, we're gonna do something different. Don't we normally think of the story like this? What we have is a contrast between Martha and Mary, right? Okay, and what we think is Martha is a doer and Mary is a contemplative, or she, she's, you know, she's, she's a real deep spiritual person who, likes, who would rather sit at the feet of Jesus. And so there, there are doers and there are people who sit at the feet of Jesus. And of course, the takeaway from the story is that the doer is not as good as the contemplative one who sits at the feet of Jesus. That's pretty much what we do with it, right? All right, I'm going to show you what Jesus does with it when you pay attention. <laughs> All right, this is too fun. Okay, listen to these words. But Martha was distracted with much service. That's what the word said. Distracted. Is she a doer? I don't know. It never really tells us she's a doer. (laughs) This is just saying she's distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, uh, approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. All right, who in the house loves Jesus? (laughs) <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> Who in the house loves Jesus? <laughs> okay, here comes Jesus. Verse 41, And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. All right, we're going to break this down. Do you notice he says she's two things? Again, not just one. There's two things. She's worried and troubled. You can't make this up. Do you know what the word um, worried means in the original? I mean, it means worried, but when you really dig at the root words, what they would have been thinking, it means anxious and and even, put your seatbelt on, careful. Say, Martha, Martha, you're, the first one is, you're anxious. You're very, very careful. (laughs) <laughs> are, are there things in your life that you're very, very careful about? Take a lot of your energy and time. You know, when I first started in this role, because you all know I'm a very wounded person. I'm still on my recovery journey. Um, and when I first started in this role, almost seven years ago now, um, I would spend all week sometimes preparing for the sermon. It wasn't because I liked you that much. I'm serious. It was a wounding problem. (laughs) I had to do that. I was very anxious and careful. (laughs) Because if I don't perform well enough, I might die. 
is what my wounds made me feel like. I'm doing much, much better now. I still have plenty of anxiety every Sunday morning, but God's healing me and I'm much, much better, okay? And so praise God, right, th thank you, or I, I wouldn't have made it this many years, I promise you. <laughs> Notice this word. Now, I want you to, before I even move on, I got to show you this because this is, what, this is what's on my heart to tell you. And this is what we got to do. You see, there's a behavior. She's distracted with much serving. That's just a behavior. You see that? Okay. Jesus will all, have you ever noticed he always cuts to the heart? He never stays at the surface. Does he do that with you? Yeah, and he's not going to stop. What he does is, he, you, we are aware of behaviors. And what happened here is Jesus goes straight to the heart. Um, he doesn't even mention her, her busy bodiness or the fact, or, or boy, you're really missing out. He doesn't even go there. Where Jesus goes is he says, Martha, Martha, you're worried. He goes straight to her, her heart. You are worried. You're anxious and careful. And here's the second one, and troubled. This one you really can't make up. Troubled actually more closely translates as disturbed. And I know we all know what that, you all know what disturbed means. But I had to kind of look that up in the English dictionary and go, what does disturbed mean? You ready for this? Disturbed means having had its normal pattern or function disrupted. So what's he doing? He's going, he's going, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and, and very careful, okay? <laughs> and you're troubled. In other words, you're disturbed from your, nor your normal function is disrupted. What, huh? Rain man. Rain man. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> right. Um, it's, so he is noting that the problem is not this behavior. The problem is this carnal mindedness, if you will. Everything we've been teaching in this series, being wrapped in this world, actually being disturbed about this and that and what's going on and my vulnerability and oh, what might happen. I'm, I'm good at that. I'm getting better and better, but the worry is, is concern about what might happen, what's already happened. It is, do you know worry has nothing to do with the present moment? He says, you're worried and troubled about many things. Oh, I got to tell you this. Do you know the root word of troubled actually means crowd? Put your helmets on. <laughs> Brace for this. In other words, what, what this is saying, what Jesus is saying is, is um, Martha, Martha, you're, you're, um, you're disturbed from, from having your normal function is disrupted and in this, this word they would have understood to mean like because you've joined into the, disturbing, the disturbance of the crowd. Are you guys tracking with me? In other words, you've joined into the anxiety and the worry and the disturbance, all this distraction that the world pumps at you and you've gotten so wrapped in it that, that you've been disturbed from your normal function. Now, in this passage, we're about to find out what our, our normal function is, but I'll just tell you now, um, as I know it's killing you, you really want to know bad. It's, <laughs> it's worship, and it's in this passage. The normal function, you see, here's what we got to get. The presence of God is in the room. Jesus is in the room. Are you following me? And but, but what did it say? She's distracted with much serving. And Jesus says, well, the problem is not that you're distracted with much serving. It's that you've joined in to the atmosphere of the day. You've joined into the crowd. You're troubled and anxious and careful, worried about many things. And it's just on my heart. This is what, this is happening. Okay, this is why I'm doing this series this whole this is why we're on number seven, <laughs> because I, I think it's it is the the problem of our day, at the moment. We're so far from the present moment; it's just crazy. And what's happening? What Jesus is confronting with Martha is that she is missing the blessing of the present moment. She is missing the very presence of Jesus in the room. 
And we're bombarded anymore in this world. That's, what, that's why I think it was two weeks ago um, I made about 15% of y'all mad because I'm going, turn off the news. Okay, I'm not telling you to stick your head in the sand. I'm just saying when we get to the point that we have an addiction about what to be worried about and have anxiety over, do you know what that's going to do to your life? It's going to make you miss the presence of God in the room. And it's, it's just happening. I think it's a toxin. It's a poison that's in the church. And now forget about the church for a minute. It's a toxin for you that causes you to miss the present move of God. What wonderful thing he wants you to, instead of worrying about things while you're grocery shopping or whatever, who in there it, does he want to do a miracle for? <laughs> because the kingdom of God is there because you're there. But if we're anxious and worried about everything, with the voice of God will be, will be so quiet, so distant, you won't even know it. You'll walk right by the miracle that he has planned for you in that moment. And that is given up everything good, which leads us right where we're going. He goes on, the next part of his response is, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. One part. Do you see that this is not a thing about between like a doer and a more contemplative spiritual person? It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with, with freedom from woundedness that frees our mind to agree with the faith we've been given. Frees us to live lives of understanding that hear his voice. This passage is actually about that. Um, if I was to guess, I would say Mary is very much a doer too. In fact, we're about to hear her do something. Do you ever think about it that way? She is about to do something. She's about to anoint Jesus. And that's something to do. <laughs> She's a doer. Hers is just <laughs> Hers is just in the presence and the movement of God in the present moment. It's not busyness because because she's not riddled by the cares, anxieties, worries of this world. One thing is needed. Do you know um, the word part is added? So in other words, this reads, but one thing is needed and Mary has chosen that good part. Part is not in the original language. It's just not there. It's, it's added because we, we like it better that way. <laughs> it actually reads, and Mary has chosen that good. The word good, yeah, I'm actually going to define it for you. <laughs> From the Greek, it's beneficial toward well-being or beautiful. So what does that say? Mary has chosen what's beneficial, what's toward well-being, towards that which is beautiful. And she's a lot like you. <clears throat> which will not be taken away. Do you know the only thing that'll not be taken away from you in the end game? Choosing that which is good, which is awareness of God's presence in the, presence, in the present moment. What steals that, that we just, we just learned from the word of God? What steals awareness of God in the present moment? Toss them out for me. Worry, troubled, confused, anxiety, Busyness. Yeah. Good, 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 good. And all of this, we're not done yet. Go flip back to John. And while you're doing that, I'll, I'll tell you this. All of this with, with Martha. Martha is in the room with a guy who was dead five minutes ago. <laughs> if there was ever an atmosphere where faith might come easy <laughs> or where your mind could agree that I don't need to be worried about stuff, it's, it's the miracle of God, okay? Can I just tell you, I'm not picking on Martha. I plan on having a good conversation with her, even though she's gotten a really bad rap, hasn't she? I mean, she's, <laughs> she's going to, when we get to the next stage in heaven, she's going to have a lot of, com she's going to be like, yes, I'm that one. <laughs> okay, back at John 12, verse, verse 3. 
Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. See, worship. What's the one thing? As long as we're aware, do you know every single moment of your life, God is there. (laughs) Even in the terrible ones, when everything's going wrong, God is there. And worship is the one thing. Only one thing is needed. And there's no such thing as worship without awareness of him. Um, Okay, verse four. All right, I'm gonna gonna cruise through this because I I think you guys got it. Is this blessing you? Okay, Verse 4, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. Okay, let me make sure you're connecting. You realize this is everything we've been talking about, right? Okay, Martha is anxious and worried about things, and... um, So is Judas, right? You know, nobody sins because they woke up in the morning and they thought it was a great day to sin. It's it's just true. I mean, we, we can get to a hard heart where in the word of God, it tells us that where depravity has gone, has gone so far off where there's, there's just a bitterness and there's an enmity against God where sin has gotten really natural to us, but nobody wakes up and says, I want to do the worst thing I can, I can do today. And really it's, it's on purpose. Hear this. It's Everything that we do that is contrary to God is, comes from our woundedness. It comes from a vulnerability that says, I'm not okay, I'm not secure in my father. And that's all we're reading here about both people, Martha and Judas. You know, in the, in the end of it all, there are, there are um, 11 people at the table with Jesus at that marriage supper of the Lamb, that last supper, that are going to go with him, right? There's a 12th one that is going to betray him on that night. In fact, isn't it funny that I, it identifies that? I just caught this. It identifies that in the scripture that we just read. And Judas, can, I just put it out, Judas is operating from the carnal mind, from the natural man. Y'all remember what we said the natural man is? The enmity, and and it's the wounded man, right? It's the man that's not secure in the truth. See, and I don't know, um, I'm wrapping here now, and we're gonna do something. We're gonna invite the Holy Spirit to do something. And I don't know, um, the word of God doesn't really tell us. Was Judas deceived? Like when he said this, when he had this response to Jesus, um, did he know that he was giving Jesus trouble um, because he wanted to steal the money? Or could it be that he was actually deceived in his heart? That like he was really kind of believing that when he was giving Jesus trouble. But he'd gotten to the point, is that making sense? Is that, I don't know which way that goes. I don't know if he consciously wanted to steal the money in that moment or if he was deceived into just, just the way that he thinks that like, like what a waste and he's anxious and carnally minded and worried, troubled about money and things in this life to where his, most, his very natural response would be to give Jesus trouble about such a waste <laughs> that Mary's doing. Is that fine? Fa- I don't know which it is, but I do know that the word of God is telling us two things in the things we've done this this morning. And both of them are in this one story, okay? And one is joining the crowd with the anxiousness of this world will steal the presence of God from the minutes in your day. 
And the second one is, is the worries of this world will also cause us to think contrary. Remember, the carnal mind is enmity, is is enemy against. The worries of this world will also cause us to, to, um, to think contrary to the way Jesus thinks. And you remember Jesus, um, not, well, Jesus, we should just say his name 10 more times, but um, Martha was distracted with busyness. Those words should really pierce through our hearts, don't you think? I don't want to miss a drop of God's presence in my days. And I've just noticed this world is per- perfectly designed to make sure you are continuously distracted. And so I might pose, I think we're going to pose this question to the Holy Spirit in just a minute, but I want to put it out there now. Where are you busy? (laughs) And what I want to say about that, it's not that all busyness is bad. I just want to say, where are you distracted with busyness? Oh, I have to do this. Thank you, God. Um, What was she distracting from? We have to do this. Say it. Okay, she was distracted from the the blessing that's available. Why would she be a busy person, though? Like, what was she distracting herself from? The anxiety and the troubled, and the trouble, right? It's so important to recognize that. And so when I pose that at you, where are you riddled in the distraction of busyness? You know, the invitation here is... Take it to the next step. In other words, what wound, what fear, what anxiety, or what trouble are you distracting yourself from? That's what the word of God is telling us. Do you know that even our prayers can become busy and distracted? The multiplication of words over things that, that you, you have no anointing for. God has given no anointing for you to even pray over things at these levels. You're not even involved in ministry in those places and the things you've become very busy about praying. Is that making sense? We can become busy. We can become distracted in busyness even in what we come to believe is our conversation with him and call it Holy. I'm just telling you that because I'm good at it. (laughs) I don't want you guys to, you you feel that, right? You feel the love? I am so good at at all the things I'm talking about. It's uncanny. I can go for days and be like, man, where in the last three days have I had the awareness of God's presence, of Jesus's actual presence in my day? of participating, actual awareness of participating with him in something. Are you you following that? That's a real real problem because we already established his presence is in every moment (laughs) of your life. We'll leave it at that. In both cases, all right, here's my last point. I, I think I get to say that about three times. <laughs> here's my last point. Um, in both cases, in fact, let me read this, verse 7. But Jesus said, let her alone. I'm not even going to read the rest. That's the part. In both cases, he basically says about Mary, let her alone. <laughs> in the first case, the way he says it is that it's not going to be taken away from her. Her choosing the good not being distracted, not being riddled with anxiety, her choosing to worship in the present moment, to be aware of me and worship in the present moment, that'll not be taken away. And here to Judas, he says, let her alone. That's what he's going to say over you when you choose the good, the beneficial, that which is towards well-being. What what else did it mean? You didn't know good could be such a complicated word, did you? doesn't matter um i want to um invite if y'all want to go your mission should you choose to accept is to is to begin to just take a moment with the holy spirit okay i'm going to lead you in this yeah thank you god okay and so i invite you just um first of all 
let your body, <laughs> pay attention to your body and let it relax to the point that you can actually become aware of his presence right here, right now. If you're comfortable with it, close your eyes. Relax your body. And you know, I want to say start, start at the top. Pay attention to where you have tension in your body. Start at your shoulders. And move down your body. All the way to your feet. And our prayer becomes, come Holy Spirit right now. We thank you that you are here right now and you always want to interact, that we're your beloved. We thank you that you're here, but we ask, Lord, give us a tangible sense of your presence in and around us right now, Lord. And Holy Spirit, we come to you with this question. And we believe that you will bring shine a light. You will bring revelation. Holy Spirit, we ask you, show us one place, just one, where we are busy. We're distracted with busyness. And you want us to know about it. Holy Spirit, the thing that you showed me, help me trace it to my heart. Why do I allow that distraction? Why do I choose that distraction? Holy Spirit, will you, will you tell us what I'm worried and troubled about? Bring that to my awareness now. Now I invite you, if you want, just hold your palms up out in front of you, okay? And let an image form this thing that he's revealed to you that, that causes you anxiousness, worry, and trouble. And imagine that in your hands. Hold that anxiety. Lord, I even ask that you would allow a picture to form. What does that look like as we hold this weight in our hands. Lord, let us feel how heavy is this thing that we're carrying. Now let a picture emerge of Jesus' hands stretched out in front of you, stretched out toward you. His palms are up. Or just a sense of that. And now you get to decide if you're going to keep holding that worry and trouble or you can choose to turn your palms and, and let, it, let it drop off into his hands. We thank you, Jesus, that you are capable <laughs> of taking our worries, our anxieties, what troubles us. And Father, I ask a blessing over your bride this morning, those that are here, even those that are not here, that the miracle would move to them. I ask a blessing that you would do a miracle, that you would strip off 
the way the world has heaped things on us, the things that steal our awareness of your presence. In the strong name of Jesus, I bless you in his name with the dropping off of distractions and anxieties that that steal your awareness of his presence in the moments of your day. And I bless you with the replacement of confusion. It, it'll now be replaced with understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.